I used to use the Sway Suite a lot in Drupal 7. Yeah, yeah it's nice. Um, then, yeah, when we, when we got to Drupal 8, we found we didn't necessarily need it, or I think we kind of went for a more code based approach yeah. as opposed to you know, anything through the UI. Yeah. And that generally made sense for our project, but I, I guess it depends on your team. But like certainly, if, if, mm. if you've got a very small project with a small budget, maybe something like Panel is going to get you there quicker than anything else. Or possibly. possibly. Um, well, I was thinking there's a complexity of maintaining it afterwards. Yeah. Because unless it's absolutely documenting perfectly, yeah. it's like, how the hell is this getting into the page? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I guess you can get that with any. With anything as well. So. Yeah. Then, um, yeah, then all, all your normal <laughs> avenues have vanished. If you yeah, that's it. You're going to have to do it this way. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But, um, there was definitely a, a Drupal 7 project I did which was fully panels. Like, ridiculous. Like, yeah. In terms of performance, it, just, it, was, it was dire. Because yeah. it, it provided the ability to just drag and drop anything anywhere with, any, with no kind of sense of caching or bottom yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely everywhere. Yeah, Really difficult to maintain. Mm. Uh, yeah. I mean, cash, caching seems to be very good, anyway. Yeah, I found so. Yeah. Uh, was not every round that's going on. Yeah. 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 Hi. Hello. My talk was a cash. Yeah, one problem. You were going to do a talk? No, um, super fast. I was going to do a talk. I'm going to do a talk. I said, I'm going to do a talk. No one's helping. <laughs> For a second, I thought you were going to go in and do a little bit of 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 a that's about as much as I can. It's about as much information as I can. Yeah. I'm not doing it like this.
40 seconds ago. <laughs> okay, I'll get started. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Steve Richards. Uh, I'm here to talk today about uh, uh, a project that we um, uh, recently did uh, for a Premiership Football Club. Um, I think Drupal 8 um, uh, provides uh, a really good backbone for, um, for, for, for modern fan engagement. Uh, and uh, I think this, this talk is going to illustrate uh, like some of the complexity, uh, some of the challenges that the business has, uh, and we'll do a little deep dive into a few of the uh, specific areas and a few of the components of the project as well. Uh, so, apologies first. Um, it's such a rich medium uh, for, for puns that I'm going to have to do a few footballisms uh, along the way. So, uh, yeah, first, apologies for that. But I think it kind of frames it in quite a nice way. Um, so a bit of an introduction to myself. Um, I'm a Drupal developer, uh, primarily back-end. Uh, I've been working uh, with Drupal for over 10 years. Um, when, uh, when I was younger, this is me, back in the days when I had actual hair, and uh, yeah, wore really cool hats, apparently. Um, I was uh, an Arsenal fan. So uh, little Steve would run about in a, in a little Arsenal kit. Um, those were the days before I found music, before I found computers, before I found uh, Nintendo. Um, nevertheless, um, this project um, held like a, a really uh, big place in my heart, and something that I got really excited about when I heard that um, it was a project that we had won. So uh, it was an exciting prospect. Um, it was going to be an extensive project uh, with some really complex goals. Um, and some of those kind of overarching goals, uh, they really wanted to increase their fan engagement. Uh, they really wanted to extend the, uh, the reach of their digital fan base. Uh, they wanted to look at ways that they could, uh, could monetize uh, and drive traffic to their kind of revenue streams, to their, to their shops and, and to their, their partners. So uh, we had an extensive uh, bid team, uh, and then finally that culminated uh, in a final uh, pitch at our office. Uh, everyone got in their best football kit, and uh, ultimately we won the project. So here's some of our extended uh, pitch team uh, on that. Uh, so that culminated in, in a re-platform. Uh, so they wanted to optimize their platform for mobile. They wanted to make it future-proof, uh, and they wanted to centralize their content. So previously, everything had been split out across a few different, uh, different platforms. Uh, and they wanted to add ongoing value, uh, find a way that they could build on what they had uh, and continue kind of iterating it over, over time. So we had uh, an extended team uh, that was uh, led by, um, by us in Vika. Uh, and that was out of a number of different offices uh, in London, Brighton, Manchester and Sheffield. Uh, but it was also a project that we won and implemented in partnership with another couple of agencies. Uh, so Phase 2, who uh, a number of you will know, uh, based out of the States. Uh, so our, our team extended uh, across the Atlantic as well. And Ost Modern, who's a, a London-based um, design agency. Uh, so. We moved into implementation. Uh, that started with a uh, very extensive discovery process, um, looking at all their uh, long-term goals and analysing all the different uh, different platforms that they that they were currently using. And uh, that, of course, ended with us recommending Drupal 8. Um, I think partially because it ticked all the boxes, uh, but also because of we had done at this. At this point, at least one Drupal 8 project, I think we'd reached that tipping point where Drupal 7 wasn't an option anymore, and Drupal 8 really had started to kind of gain traction. So this was back, I think, summer of 2016, something like that. Uh, so on the recommendation of phase two, we kind of moved into a, an atomic-based uh, design process, uh, and that was using Pattern Lab. Um, and that ultimately culminated in multiple Drupal themes to handle the, uh, the, the various different properties. Uh, that existed within this single platform. Uh, and that was uh, arsenal.com, uh, player.arsenal.com, and uh, the Junior Gunners site. So everything running off the same code base, but being displayed in slightly different ways. Uh, and then ultimately, it had to power um, a REST API. Uh, their existing platform had 
a REST API that serviced um, their mobile apps. Uh, and this platform would have to be a direct replacement for that. Uh, so we sketched out a, um, a basic uh, architecture diagram for that, uh, with Drupal 8 at the center of everything, acting as a content hub, um, delivering JSON uh, to the, uh, to the uh, uh, Android and iOS apps, uh, delivering RSS feeds and, uh, and content out through the pattern library out to uh, desktops and mobiles in that way. So, um, continuing the re-platform, we also had to utilize their existing CDN uh, and as part of, the, uh, part of the rebuild, we would also be migrating to Platform SH, um, as well as servicing all those API users, of which there is very, uh, very, very many, uh, and migrating all of their legacy content from their existing system, which luckily was PHP and MySQL based, uh, into uh, into a Drupal 8 platform. Okay, so I'm going to kick off into the first half now and go through some, uh, some, some components of the project here. So that's the business stuff out of the way. Um, kick off. Sorry, I really like transitions. <laughs> um, so, as you can imagine, with a, um, a property such as Arsenal.com, uh, performance considerations need to come in at a very early stage and you really need to think about how you're going to be handling that, that level of data. Uh, so to give you a bit of an idea, uh, these are some stats from October 2017. Uh, so through the API, uh, they were doing 90 million requests um, just, just over, um, uh, over October. Uh, that culminated in 496 gigabytes of JSON data. Um, which in total, when you add in the desktop and the uh, and, uh, um, responsive mobile uh, stats as well, um, culminated in 555 million requests for October and uh, uh, around 220, uh, sorry, 22 terabytes of data. So that's, that's some serious heavy load. Uh, so typically we, we'd focus on a number of things to improve performance and load times. Uh, and so We'd look at lazy loading from, a, uh, um, uh, from, from an application perspective, try and avoid um, loading stuff that's below the fold. Uh, we'd look at profiling and how we could manage um, our, our code better. Um, we might look at internal caching uh, and, and examine kind of how we could use cache tags and cache context to, uh, to, to ensure that we're only kind of serving out things internally um, uh, as appropriate. Uh, scalable hosting, so obviously with Platform SH we have something that's very scalable, container-based uh, and, and, and can respond based on, uh, based on traffic. Uh, we'd look at load testing uh, and uh, ultimately we'd look at external caching. So, uh, and sorry, another football type thing. Um, the importance of well-time headers, so we wanted to leverage the CDM as much as possible, so we wanted to really put the focus on how we could optimize uh, the site from the outside in. Uh, so uh, typically you would use like a CDN or a proxy cache provider for this. So the platform works very well with Fastly, they're a partner with Fastly. Um, Cloudflare is, so is something that I'm sure many of you use, uh, many of you have used before. Um, and Limelight uh, if it was a CDN provider which, um, which, which our client is actually uh, working with at the time. Uh, they had a very good relationship with them and wanted to continue on that process. So, uh, so we, we looked at how we could uh, how we could integrate with that. Uh, so, if you've used Cloudflare before, you might put your DNS uh, configuration directly into Cloudflare, and that would be kind of handled by Cloudflare, and you wouldn't necessarily need to worry too much about it. Uh, but in terms of Limelight, there was a lot of um, configuring things ourselves and, 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 and going through the steps really to kind of make this make this work as uh, efficiently as possible. So what I've got here is just a basic diagram of kind of how, uh, how the traffic would come in. So the traffic comes into your edge server, um, to, your, to your edge load balancer, and then, and then through, through the CDN and down to origin. So what you really are looking to do is to minimize your traffic to origin as much as possible and to utilize the CDN in the most efficient way possible is the best way to do that. So we're really focusing on the edge here and focusing on minimizing the traffic down to origin there. So we do that, we, we place an HTTP, HTTP auth between the CDN and origin, so the only thing that can get to origin is, uh, is authenticated traffic from the, uh, from the CDN. 
So, as I said, we're utilizing the existing uh, CDM provider. Um, we had to have a seamless transition at launch, so that as far as the fans were concerned, as far as, uh, as, far as the client was concerned, nothing would change between, uh, uh, between um, <coughs> pre-launch and post-launch. Uh, and obviously serving it across these multiple channels of web uh, and the API and handling our 555 million requests a month um, upwards of, I, I quickly checked uh, January's and it was, I think, significantly more than that. So uh, we do that using uh, cache control headers. Um, so Drupal obviously implements this out of the box. There's nothing we necessarily have to do to make this happen. But it's worth knowing uh, the kind of mechanics of how this works. Uh, so cache control um, is, is a header that also specifies this max age uh, value, which um, de defines the lifetime of the page and essentially how long the page is fresh for and how long it can persist in a CDN cache. So if you were to uh, take your Chrome browser and inspect um, inspect a request, uh, we're inspecting the Arsenal.com request here, uh, and we can see that the cache control header is saying that this, this page will exist for 300 uh, seconds. Uh, and specifically, um, this page is 43 seconds old. Yeah, thereabouts. So Drupal um, Core has a few caching limitations out of the box. Uh, so you get, uh, in your performance tab here, you get uh, some caching options, uh, or a caching option. That's literally what you can get out of the box. It has a maximum cache lifetime of one day, uh, and that's global for, for your entire application. And that might work for 90% of sites. Uh, so straight away we looked at implementing this module. Uh, this is the advanced page exploration module. Uh, this uh, gives you some additional max age options. Uh, it allows you to define some alternate caching options and gives you a UI for managing these, which ultimately you can pass to the client. Uh, it also uh, exposes some custom uh, events uh, and hooks that you can also implement to kind of uh, um, output your own logic for, uh, for, for, for covering uh, different um, scenarios and different uh, business logic. So the UI for this uh, looks like this, it's very similar, um, but straight away you can see we've got one month uh, global expiration time uh, as well as up to one year. Uh, so it also gives you these two different caching levels, so you can add uh, out of the box, so you can say uh, generally pages will, um, on, on, on these parts will cache for this amount of time, but you can specify, say the home page might be 30 minutes. Why is this great? So that, that means that you can, you can give different lifetimes to different pages based on how, how regularly the content changes. So you can really kind of determine from within the Drupal UI, tell it exactly how long a page should exist for. So home pages and news pages might be changing very, very regularly. And actually Arsenal's home page changes every five minutes, every minute maybe. Um, and uh, a player profile, for example, might stay for a month, a year. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a massive football fan, but I don't think this changes very much. Um, but it also gives us this, um, this ability to, to, to specify some sensible defaults so that we can have that fallback generally for everything. Um, and so what it meant for us is that, um, yeah, we could, we could essentially uh, launch and do a soft launch and, and, and through the UI we could configure uh, how long we wanted that global expiration to be, how long we wanted that fallback expiration to be and, uh, and kind of change that value over time as we, as we kind of measure the performance in the server. So it allowed us to kind of manage that gradual escalation of traffic to origin uh, directly through the UI. So uh, I don't want to trivialize this, um, so um, our implementation was anonymous only, uh, so obviously it's harder to cache authentication, uh, authenticated traffic. Um, this sort of aggressive caching uh, will produce its own problems. If you find that a page isn't quite correct in the, in the, uh, in the CDN UI, they have to wait for it to expire, or go to your uh, uh, CDN UI and start purging objects, which really you want to do as 
infrequently as possible. Uh, and so a future scope, at least for our implementation, would be to kind of look at uh, how we could provide regional content, uh, potentially using edge side includes or, uh, or Ajaxing in content into the page so that we're still serving out the same page for everyone, which is kind of in, uh, injecting the kind of personal content into the page. Um, implementing some kind of deep level CDN integration, so if you've used uh, um, Farsi, for example, there is a Farsi module that enables you to expire stuff directly in the CDN based on a kind of content change directly in Drupal using cache tags. Um, and yeah, extend the expiration logic that we get out of the box. We have a few rules that, that already exist kind of below the surface, below those kind of two different options, and uh, we could extend those to kind of have different different ways of cache in different ways. So. Uh, how do we know that we're ready uh, for all that traffic? How do we know that we're kind of there? Uh, so obviously we do that by testing and measuring. And so in this project, um, we used uh, Apache JMeter uh, to, 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 to basically simulate some behaviors, simulate some traffic over time, uh, ramping it up, uh, and then reviewing New Relic in the background to kind of see um, what came out of that. So, to be able to review errors and to be able to review bottlenecks and the overall performance as we're hammering the site through through JMeter. And JMeter also um, gives you, a, uh, you, can, you can use BlazeMeter to, to, to run your JMeter test and that's kind of the, the tool that we use ultimately. Cool. Okay, so into the second half. Um, I'm not sure what the score is. I'm not really keeping score. Um, so, uh, in the second half, I wanted to look at um, the Symphony components in core um, and explore some, some real world examples of kind of the, these components in action and kind of see how they really bolster kind of Drupal uh, and, and Drupal 8 specifically. <coughs> so obviously it's opened the door to a lot of new design patterns uh, and that's something that we really embraced on this project. Um, it enabled us to kind of use external libraries. Uh, I guess you could use external libraries before, but I think this this kind of provided a slightly more flexible way for kind of pulling in services um, uh, from from kind of packages libraries and stuff like that. <coughs> Obviously, dependency injection. I'm not going to explain dependency injection now. I think there was a session this morning on that, so um, it's worth kind of delving into that. Uh, but ultimately, it meant that our code was more efficient. Uh, plugins. Uh, and the event dispatcher and uh, subscriber. And uh, I really want to explore the last one of these because I think this was the one that we really utilized the most. So um, one of the key ways that we wanted to utilize this was to, uh, to notify the fans. Uh, so one of the key requirements was to send match event push notifications. Uh, so uh, we had to replicate this existing behavior um, using their API using their current mobile apps, uh, using the predefined external service that they already had. Uh, so we had to integrate with that API. And also, uh, most importantly, we had to avoid sending fake notifications like BBC did here. <laughs> so um, as yet, we've not sent any fake notifications. Is that right, Felix? You haven't sent any fake ones yet. No. <laughs> no. So um, yeah, it takes steps to make sure that we can and send everything out to their millions and millions of fans or whatever it is. So, um, of course, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, there wasn't a Drupal 8 module uh, that integrated <coughs> with, uh, with their um, API. Uh, but there, there was, however, a PHP library uh, available that did integrate with Urban uh, Airship, uh, which is the, uh, the notification provider here. Uh, so this provided um, a key opportunity to kind of look at our, our toolbox. So I wanted to introduce you here to, uh, to Felix. He's over here. <laughs> Hi, <Felix>. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so Felix was a Symphony developer. I say he was, I guess he still is a Symphony developer. Uh, but he has extensive knowledge of, uh, of uh, and a passion for Symphony and PHP best practices. Um, However, he was new to Invika and Drupal when we started this project. Yeah, but however, being passionate about Symphony, uh, he went to Symphony Live and he was um, uh, inspired by a session that he saw at Symphony Live. And actually, uh, one of the key questions that he kept on asking me throughout the beginning of the project was, what, why, why are we doing things this way? Why aren't we doing things the kind of modern design pattern way? 
so a lot of my time is spent explaining truth and settle uh, isms. And uh, yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, so yeah, Felix was inspired by uh, another employee's um, Symphony Live presentation uh, and was now able to use these components uh, in a Drupal uh, environment. So he was able to create a reusable implementation using the subscriber and the dispatcher uh, and integrate with any existing work that we had within the site, utilize that PHP library that we just identified and add that as a component, uh, as, as a dependency uh, in our composer.json, so that you know, including that library was fairly trivial at that point. So, this is what that um, journey looked like. Uh, and so, essentially, this is driven by the uh, by the editorial team. They'll uh, put in an action into the CMS. That action, in this case, is a goal. Um, that will fire a pre-save hook. So, yeah, we all know that hooks still exist in Drupal 8. However, that gave us the jumping point to kind of prepare the event um, data and then dispatch that event. And so this is um, a very kind of uh, basic version of what that event dispatcher uh, looks like. That's, that's the subscriber. <laughs> this is the dispatcher. There you go. So that's the dispatcher. Um, it's a very basic version, doesn't include all the, all the extra code around it, but enabled us to uh, implement this and then dispatch this event. Uh, and the important thing about dispatching events as opposed to maybe kind of triggering a function is, you know, it wouldn't break if there was nothing at the other end to catch it. There's, there's kind of a very loose dependency there. So um, ultimately, we, uh, we catch that event with our subscriber. This is subscribing specifically to the, uh, to the event that we've just sent. And then ultimately, we can utilize the uh, uh, Urban Airship service uh, to send out that notification and to basically trigger it at that point and send it out to everyone's um, phones. So the other thing I wanted to kind of um, uh, take a look at was a, uh, another off-the-shelf um, piece of work that we used and then integrated with. So uh, essentially this was managing uh, Twitter media uh, so, um, as a bit of an overview, um, all Arsenal players tend to have a Twitter account. Uh, Arsenal themselves has their own Twitter account, and uh, and obviously players are continually communicating about the games, about kind of a, um, about events around uh, around the games. Uh, so they want to be able to uh, to integrate those into their uh, into their uh, minute by minute flows and into their news articles and to kind of really harness that that rich media. However, they had some strict rules around the kind of storage uh, and, and kind of the sponsorship and the kind of tone of voice uh, of those tweets. So um, we were challenged with kind of looking at how we could pull that data in, but in a kind of manageable way. So uh, we looked at the media entity Twitter module and uh, this um, has a tweet fetcher service built in. Uh, so I encourage you to look at kind of services in Drupal 8, but essentially what this gives you is a, uh, a service that is available kind of globally that you can call on uh, to kind of utilize any of the kind of uh, functionality around, in this case, the Twitter API integration. So this enabled us to retrieve, uh, retrieve tweets uh, using a, uh, a, a tweet handle. Uh, and then because it was uh, based on media entity, uh, it also allowed us to, to, to map that data to entity fields uh, and store that data locally. So this was a key requirement um, of, uh, of, of Arsenal uh, in that they wanted to retain full control over the data, they wanted to re retain the kind of full control over the display. Uh, and I think that's really important because of, you know, that, that, that meant that they were able to kind of um, use it and display it in any kind of way that they um, they saw sort of fit really. Uh, so it also, uh, the, the module also include, includes a Twitter-based formatter, uh, but yeah, it does give you the ability to kind of take those fields uh, and as you map them to kind of data locally, you can render them just using uh, Twig directly. So uh, this is the uh, uh, basic media um, type of uh, Twitter. Uh, so it extends the kind of uh, the, the, the media type base, so it harnesses kind of all the kind of media uh, entity type that's in core. 
uh, and then extends that to kind of create a version uh, specifically for Twitter. Um, so it's worth it's worth noting that um, we added a number of different patches over the course of the project uh, to kind of extend the capabilities of this module as well, uh, and that was essentially to kind of um, make make sure it could keep up with Twi uh, with, with Twitter's API. And part of that's uh, accessing extended tweets. Um, uh, so yeah, you, you have a slightly uh, richer level of data in the tweet. <coughs> uh, also to map more fields uh, that, that, that then get exposed in that way. Um, Twitter supports animated GIFs and videos and we want to be able to map that and, and have, have that something that could be kind of displayed in any news feed. Uh, and also to handle multiple images, which was something which was, uh, which was added to Twitter's API over the course of our project. So um, I think there's something for me to do on that in terms of finishing the patch, but the code's up there if you, uh, if you need to extend it and you need to use that, that's, that's all on Drupal. Uh, so I want to give a, uh, a little bit of an outline of the journey um, that you might see as a, as, as a player uh, tweets about something and then how that might end up um, within our media storage. So. Uh, we associate each player with a Twitter handle, uh, and then that goes through into our tweet manager service. So we can we can retrieve all players that, that, that will have a Twitter handle, and then we can utilise the uh, tweet fetcher service that media entity Twitter has given us, and we can use that to access the Twitter API. So I think what's what's really um, really key with this is that we have dedicated services that kind of handle the sole responsibility. So we split out everything. Uh, and we, we don't try and group everything together as we might historically have done in, like a, in, in, a, in a Drupal 7 module. We split everything out into its, into its individual components. Uh, but additionally, uh, we interrupt the kind of standard media entity Twitter flow uh, by adding uh, this blacklist constraint validator. Uh, so this is, uh, this is another component that um, we have available to us in core. Uh, we can extend the, uh, the constraint validator class to, to implement something that will uh, interrupt that flow and stop certain tweets coming in if they match certain criteria. Uh, and that was specifically uh, a blacklist of terms or a blacklist of sponsors or a blacklist of like things that don't match the tone of voice or match the kind of the, uh, the, the information which, uh, which, which uh, the team want to, want to kind of distribute. So what that means is that then we can automate everything. We can have a cron hook that will uh, or build out a queue, triggering our tweet manager service to ingest all of the player tweets uh, and then put them in the media storage ready for the editorial team to use as they see fit. Uh, and actually, if you go to arsenal.com today, you'll see a, a, a player tweets page and that lists everything that they've tweeted. Every 30 minutes, it goes off and ingests any of the kind of most recent <coughs> ones and then displays them, uh, filters out any that don't match the tone of voice. But ultimately, because if we're just storing it as media storage, they can go in and change those, they can edit those and, and delete those as they see fit as well. So if something gets through, they can delete it that way as well. And so here's an example of our uh, constraint validator. Uh, so we're uh, exposing um, a, a list that they can add to of just text stop terms that they can add. And then ultimately, um, as we're ingesting uh, a tweet, we can, we can um, trigger this validator to then see if it contains any of those terms. So it just provides a really nice way of kind of automating that, but kind of giving it a bit of sanity and giving, giving some, some level of kind of checking along the way. So um, yeah, ultimately, I think it's no surprise that Drupal 8 gains significantly from, uh, from, from the Symphony components which have been added to it. I think there's a number of different realized benefits here. Uh, specifically, transferable skills. Uh, so I think we, saw, we saw with Felix and a number of the um, other people in our team have been able to jump onto a Drupal 8 project, having very little Drupal experience, but having a lot of Symphony experience. And they've been able to kind of get their hands dirty with Drupal uh, straight away, <coughs> which is not something that, that, that we saw very often with Drupal 7. Uh, I think we've seen that there's kind of less hard dependencies, obviously you could code hard dependencies if you wanted to, but 
there's the toolkit to be able to split things out and to be able to make things uh, a little bit more um, interoperable. Uh, it's more extensible in, in this way if you're splitting out your components and, 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 and kind of giving things a sole, uh, a sole responsibility. And it opens up to kind of future uh, potential. So there may not be a module for something today, but there might be a PHP library for it, and that PHP library might have certain Symfony components that, it, that it's utilizing, and so you can use that, and not necessarily wait for like a Drupal module to come along uh, to wrap around that. Uh, and yeah, from a personal preference thing as well, it gives you uh, design patterns that you can look at in other frameworks and kind of and, and, and see see kind of how they're how they're being used. And you can you can kind of neaten your code up and kind of follow some of those other standards which you might not necessarily have done before. So that's full time. Um, so there's there's a few um, other adventures which we could cover. Uh, there's not necessarily time for it for it today, uh, but there's a number of other API integrations that we did throughout this project. Uh, we integrated with a, with a sports data API called Opta. Uh, we integrated, uh, integrated with the video data API called Uyala as well, which pulls in uh, videos. Uh, entity embeds, uh, social sign-on, minute-by-minute experience, uh, and one of the key ones, I think, live match mode. So when, when the live match is happening, you'll see the whole front page kind of changes and switches to this different um, takeover page, uh, and ultimately um, uh, culminating in a kind of platform SH implementation and a full kind of sea change from them, everything building using Composer, uh, using Composer, and then going out into production uh, in, in a kind of scalable way that can react um, when there's kind of peaks and troughs. So I think overall there was a great team spirit on our project. This is a terrible picture of me. So, uh, Move on to the next one. Uh, it's slightly better. I think I look better in black. Uh, but there was a great team spirit, um, even in the face of adversity. Uh, so this was uh, uh, this was our most recent game. Uh, we lost. <laughs> Eight three. <laughs> uh, yeah, even worse. I scored a known goal. It's just, <laughs> it's just absolutely awful. I shouldn't play football. It's just, it's just terrible. But um, and six months on from launch. Um, we continue to foster a really good relationship, uh, and it's like really key to kind of getting the most out of Drupal 8, I think, to be able to kind of have that kind of product owner who's really engaged uh, and, and is able to kind of help us iterate. And actually, in this case, our product owner, the, the guy in green here, was actually on our team because uh, we were outnumbered. So, you know, I think that, that goes to show kind of how much of a, a great integrated team we had. Uh, and so, hopefully, next time, you know, I won't play and they might, they might score some more goals. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, there's time for post-match Q and A. If anyone has any questions, thank you. <laughs> oh, any questions? Well, if it's a football thing, to be asking, how long do you feel you're safe at Tim Beaker Steve? <laughs> <laughs> Mm, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. You have to ask your ear or maybe Richard. I don't know, but um, yeah. I didn't realise it's a Brighton home game tomorrow. Too. Yes, yes, that's a that's a good point. They are playing today, so um, yeah. I'm from Brighton, by the way, and uh, yeah, they're playing today. But, yeah, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> cool. Hi. So you mentioned uh, design patterns, mm -hmm. and I was just wondering if you could elaborate on us for what you felt was the most useful one in this project, and if there was um, one which you came across which works really, really well in this context. I was just wondering mm -hmm. if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yes, so um, I, think, I think the one that we've used the most, and actually across other projects, is the, the repository design pattern. So to uh, essentially keep our content um, navigable in such a way that you, know, you, can, you can have a repository for accessing uh, those specific um, entities. So, uh, for instance, we have a repository for teams, we have a repository for uh, players, uh, and specifically a repository for players that are playing in fixtures. Uh, and that kind of gives us this, this kind of way of navigating through it and kind of grouping together logic in a, in, in a very specific way. 
Um, and so that's, that's, that's probably the one I, I think is the most beneficial. And is that more relevant to Symphony, or would that work equally well on Drupal 7? It would be equally well on Drupal 7, right? <coughs> yes, yeah, I've seen it implemented in Drupal 7 as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, and it's really about, instead of kind of um, maybe putting everything in, uh, you know, a, a dot module file, you might split it out into a class and, you know, you access your content through that class. Uh, but, yeah. Um, and another question specific to a project I'm working on. Every so often, um, my server does some scraping, um, and that can slow down the page load speed naturally of our server. And I was wondering if you would recommend, giving your scaling experience, obviously far, far bigger scale than I'm at the moment, um, what your top technique to prevent that would be, or if there's anything, if that's just a, a natural thing of the design, is it just about offloading that onto a different server? Even? So is that your site's being scraped, or your scraping? Yeah, my site's being yeah. scraped. Okay. Legitimately, with, with agreement from the person. That's, yeah, yeah. That's, that's um, I think we, we've done a similar project where we, we have to scrape content. So Richard knows a bit of that, but no. <laughs> so um, and, and in that case, we've kind of off, offloaded it to like a queue. So we basically kind of said, yeah, manage it, but manage it kind of in increments over a period of time. Uh, so if so you can on the same server? Uh, so we, we move it to, to so Rabbit, so. Rabbit MQ, I think is what we used. Um, What's Rabbit MQ? So it's a, it's a kind of queuing service. Uh, but it, 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 uh, there's a module that means you can integrate it directly with Drupal's queue uh, API as well. Uh, and, that, and actually, generally, we've got a lot of tasks that kind of happen in the background. And the way that they operate is by using the queue API uh, to just queue up different tasks that you might have to do, like ingesting tweets or putting um, content down from different places. Uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll spread that out over as kind of a long, long period as possible to kind of distribute the, uh, the kind of operations, really. Thank you very much. Any more questions? I've got a question about the Twitter API. Yes. So you're saying that um, it follows a lot of different players for the team. Mm -hmm. So, is there a scenario to put in for if they start spurting off some bans to another player or something that could be damaging to the team, or if they get hacked and some spam gets thrown through? Like, how quickly does it get picked up, and does it learn from those experiences? Like, is it like self-learning? Oh no, I, I, <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> no, it's not that clever. I mean, so is there yeah. someone literally sitting there <clears throat> waiting for them to come in? Well, there's, there's a bit of that. I guess there's probably, I, I'd hope there's something in their contracts that says, you know, you can't do Being X, Y, or Z. But, but, um, but it's saying in like, yeah. scenarios like that have been hacked. Yeah, no, and absolutely. You know, if someone gets hacked, then, you know, I, yeah, I don't know. We've not had that happen yet. Okay. But, um, yeah, the, the thing we protect against is, like, you know, swearing against, like, you know, people talking about their other sponsors, because obviously, Arsenal will have one specific sponsor they have to work with. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Sorry, Philip. Yeah, yeah, as we was about to say, that we, we have a ex very extensive, there's a few thousand some the blacklist keywords that mm -hmm. if they're found in the Twitter text, the, the Twitter is not being imported into the system and just being discarded. Mm -hmm. So that could cover, hopefully, most of the situations where the, some, like, Nastier stuff could potentially yeah. be written. So if, it, if something does slip through and uh, the content team then deletes it, can yeah. they add to that blacklist? Is it easy for them to do? Well, I think in, in that scenario, you're not really sure necessarily what the tweet's going to contain. It could be, yeah. you know, someone's just saying something which, in general, every day might, might be fine, but in context, you know, could be deemed offensive or whatever. But. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. This, there, there, there are services that you can use to kind of handle your social integrations, and they'll have kind of more extensive uh, ways of managing that as a kind of intermediary, but for a cost. Yeah. Do most players have two Twitter accounts, like one for themselves and one which is their public facing one, and that'll just be done by an agent anyway? Mm -hmm. Not that I know of, but I, I, I think the only ones we deal with would be the public ones, because yeah. that's you know, exactly the mm -hmm. ones we're interested in. Um, exposing uh, API data, there's a couple of really useful modules that expose like entities as uh, API yep. stuff, uh, but that relies on you having your entities mapped the way that the 
service provider that you're providing it to wants. Sure. Um, you were trying to match it against what they already wanted. Did you did you match your design for how the, your entities worked to that, or did you just roll your own? Uh, so we um, yeah we had to match what they had. Right. And so I think in an ideal world, and and this is I think the passion of. Of, of the client hopefully going forward. And certainly, certainly something I'm advocating is for them to use some standard format like JSON API. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that we're using on other projects. Uh, and, and that kind of gives a bit more of a kind of standardized interface. But yeah, it shows all those different relationships <coughs> for the content and they can then expose it in a way that the, uh, the kind of um, the subscribers or the, um, the, 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 the actual um, devices that are ingesting it then kind of determine how they want to use it. Uh, so yeah, as it stands, I think we're iterating over different versions of the legacy uh, format, uh, which which isn't ideal, but it's still fairly clean, and um, you know, it's it's something we've built a framework to work with now, um, and and actually made it a little bit easier because of you know Drupal um, Drupal eight has a certain element of the kind of REST API built into it. So um, whilst some of the formatting has to be a little different, we were able to use a lot of the serialization um, uh, classes to kind of normalize our data mm. and kind of push it through that as well. So um, yeah, that's, that, that was another design pattern we used a lot, the normalizers to kind of filter that data. So yeah, cool. Excellent, thank you very much everyone. Um, so yeah, we're hiring. Uh, <laughs> you were hiring. Uh, and, and we are hiring as well. Sorry, it's a bit of a mistake. But yeah, if you want to come down to our um, uh, booth down there and correct me on my spelling, then, uh, yeah, please do. Thank you very much. Wrong every year. Already did it uh, wrong. Yeah, and it's not, it's not helpful. It constantly tries to auto correct it as well. Yeah, yeah. This, this is also with with uh, sprites and also turning sprites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even not a real word, I think. I don't know what it is for me. Is it? Well, no, that's not my problem. And, and the same with the beaker, actually. If ever I write a beaker, it corrects it to invert. No. <laughs> I mean, in fact, yeah, the yeah. I was really um, made by this. Um, Thank you. 
Okay. Sure yeah, I could just go on maybe I maybe I should. I'm going to have a quick smoke and have a think because I'm eating time so I'm not going to be able to.
Yeah, that's what it's not that module, but there's no way. Which one? The, the Twitter, the one that ingests the, oh, the, 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 the,